Greetings, this is Dyslexi, and welcome to episode two of Hindsight. The goal of this series is to take a look back at some sort of tactical situation from our sessions and discuss what happened, why, and what can be learned from it. Today's focus is a platoon-sized assault on a heavily fortified enemy airfield. The full scenario involves a Bradley platoon, an infantry platoon, three well-armed boats, an AH-6 flown by me, and an MH-6. We'll be focusing on the Alpha and Bravo squads from the infantry platoon. Charlie will be acting as a blocking element some distance from the airfield during this, and the Bradley platoon will be likewise engaged. The action we're looking at spans roughly 17 minutes of time in-game, starting at 5.36 a.m. Alpha and Bravo have been tasked with assaulting and securing an enemy airfield that, as noted, has been very well fortified. They'll be inserted from the sea by the aforementioned boats, at which point Alpha will move up to sweep the southeastern part of the airfield, while Bravo will move out to block any reinforcements from approaching the area from the east. Close air support is available in the form of an AH-6, which has been outfitted with a GAU-19 50 cal minigun and a rocket pod. The intent of close air support is to keep the airfield isolated during the assault, identifying and stopping vehicle threats before they can reinforce the area. Both squads are inserted without incident, with each making their way towards their initial waypoints. Looking the area over, I pass it up to the forward air controller, or FAC, that the airfield is very heavily fortified. There are many bunkers and buildings that are most likely occupied by the enemy. FAC, Reaper. Go for FAC. The airfield the ground guys are moving on right now is very heavily fortified. Understood, I will pass that on. All squads, FAC, Reaper is advising that the airfield is heavily fortified. In front of Alpha, there are two positions which I'll refer to as Line 1 and Line 2. This is Line 1, the first buildings and bunkers that Alpha will be fighting for. Directly past them is the series of buildings and bunkers that we'll call Line 2. The first line is visible on the map, while the second is not. This ends up being rather significant. As Alpha advances to the Line 1 objectives, they begin to take fire from the bunkers. Bravo is off on their right at this point, taking some light fire from their front right. Alpha makes it past the wall and sets in on the near side of the Line 1 bunkers and buildings. They're taking fierce fire from bunkers and buildings that can see them, both on the near and the far side of the airstrip. In the air, at 537, it's communicated that enemy targets will be marked with red smoke when found. All squads, in fact, if you have cash targets marked with red smoke, then call it on uh, the net. Shortly after, I identify a technical driving onto the airfield and engage it, destroying it on the road leading from the nearby town to the airfield. Alpha's having a tough time already, but it's hard to tell over the radio. Jesus. They're in trouble, but nobody knows it. A second technical rushes to the airfield, and I hit it quickly before resuming my orbit. It's 5.38 now, and Bravo's being engaged to their front right by enemies well away from the airfield. This is holding them up a bit, but thanks to the rugged terrain around them, they're able to slowly begin advancing without being too exposed on their left flank, which is the airfield itself. Bravo's squad leader identifies this bunker, Bunker 13, as a threat to their advance, and Bravo pays special attention to it as they maneuver. Just uh, worry about that two-story bunker to the uh, west. Meanwhile, Alpha has made it fully into the Line 1 area, and they're peeking around corners and attempting to engage enemies at Line 2, as well as across the airstrip. At 541, Alpha is taking a great deal of fire from their front, preventing them from easily moving up to the Line 2 positions. Despite the terrain working well in their favor, Bravo has begun to take more fire from the uncleared Line 2 positions, flanking fire that comes in from their left. They can see contacts at their Bravo 1 clear mark and report them, but the bulk of the fire they're receiving is coming from the airfield itself. We're carrying light contacts around the B1 clear marker. We're going to be moving up and clearing shortly. At this point, Alpha makes a call for CAS. Alpha, go for command. Mark, bunker at the airfield. We're taking some heavy fire there. We get some uh, CAS on that that would help us review. They're taking heavy fire from Bunker 1 near the hangar, and it's preventing them from moving up. I check the map, see the mark, and start to roll in on the target as Alpha and Platoon work through their radio issues. Bunker marked northwest of our position on the airfield. Get cast in that position that help us briefly. 
This is a judgment call on my part. I know the area, know that there are no friendlies anywhere I'll near, copy. and don't want to wait for the Double official word before copy. striking something that's currently actively shooting up friendlies. By the time the fac is passing okay. along the target, I've made my first pass Got and I'm setting up for the second. As Bravo Lead listens to the communications between Platoon, Cass, and FAC, they make an assumption that the bunker they're looking at is the same one Alpha's talking about. Yeah, Alpha's getting heavy fire from this bunker to the southwest. He's up. This plants a seed of misunderstanding that will continue to grow for the remainder of the attack. Bravo focuses on the bunker and begins engaging it, which is not a bad move in and of itself, but it will lead to problems shortly. All right, guys, Oxycube, don't go any further. We may need to uh, move and take that bunker to our southwest. As this is happening, Platoon Headquarters is landing at the coast, brought in by the MH6. They start to work their way up the draw towards Alpha and the Line 1 bunkers. Platoon asks if Bravo has a flanking position on that bunker. Bravo, thinking he means Bunker 13, responds that he doesn't. So they decide to wait for Cass to finish. Bravo, this is back, uh, orbit offshore. Send for Bravo. In the vicinity of the uh, stand Bravo may be blocked from your view. Do you have a flanking position on that bunker? Not really. I mean, I can make something work if that's what you want. Yeah, stand by. Let's hit Reaper, see what kind of effect they get on target. Bravo, copy. I asked for FAC to get a BDA, a battle damage assessment, on what just happened. FAC, you get some BDA from Alpha. Alpha, FAC, uh, BDA on Cass. Alpha's not responding, but strangely, Bravo chimes in and calls that it was good effect on target, and no enemies are in the bunker. Fact, this is Bravo, good effect on target, but I'm not seeing anybody inside the bunker. That comes. From my angle, this sounds wrong. Bravo can't see what I struck. Super fact, Bravo's reporting good effect on target. Man, this is Charlie, we've just uh, cleared the seat there, Mark. God, it wasn't that Alpha that called it in? It was, but they didn't Charlie, respond. Charlie, command copies. But since Alpha's not replying, oh well, we, we're gonna have to go with this. But again, it's a misrepresentation of the actual situation. It's now 545. Bravo has been taking continual fire from the Line 2 bunkers for some time now. Alpha. But no one seems to realize it. Chatter at the squad level makes it sound like Bravo thinks Line 2 is occupied by Alpha, and that Alpha's shooting over their heads at times. Can you ask right. Alpha to hold their fire since they're cross-firing from us right yeah, now? Yeah, I don't, I'll don't. i get them to hold their fire before we move on. Alpha checks in at this point. Command Alpha, be advised, we are approximately seven strong. They're only seven strong after taking the Line 1 bunkers. Platoon Alpha tells them to hold, switching to have Bravo attack the airfield from their position. Bravo is preparing to do this already, thinking that they'll be assaulting the bunker that was troubling Alpha earlier. At this point, I'm orbiting and I'm trying to wrap my mind around what's happening on the ground. What I'm hearing doesn't jive with what I'm seeing. Bravo has been moving forward while Alpha was stuck at the Line 1 positions, and Bravo still doesn't seem to be reacting to the fire from Line 2. Aside from that one cast call, no one has been asking for support. Bravo has been taking sustained fire from their left flank from Line 2 for many minutes now, and yet I can't see them shooting back at it. Has Alpha made it to Line 2? It's very difficult to see from my perspective. Alpha is sporadic on comms, having taken significant casualties, but it's possible that they've made it forward despite that, I can't tell. The distances involved are too close to be sure, and I can't start slinging rockets around it without significant clarification of the limits of Alpha's advance. Thinking that maybe I'm missing something, I swing around and drop low to get a look from Bravo's position. The terrain's a bit lower than I'd realized, but even still, I'm surprised that Line 2 is engaging them without response. As I get low, I can see that everyone in Bravo is looking towards Bunker 13, or to the north. No one seems to recognize the threat from Line 2. It turns out that they're so focused on the Bunker 13 assault at this point that they simply don't see anything else, or don't recognize the crack-bang, crack-bang that keeps originating from their left flank. I want to shoot at the bunkers, but now I'm not sure. They don't fire at me, and I don't know the full extent of Alpha's movement, so I hold fire. Back Reaper. I climb away and tell Fact this. Bravo is assaulting as I talk. Where Alpha's dug in right now, to their immediate northwest, there's another line of bunkers and stuff that's shooting that I believe Bravo's flank, but Bravo's not calling up. Keep checking to see what's going on there. Alpha, this is Bravo. Go for Alpha. 
Bravo SL talking about Alpha shifting fire sustains my confusion about who's where. Is Alpha actually in the Line 2 positions now, firing at the bunker Bravo's assaulting? It seems really unlikely. I have a strong sense that Line 2 is somehow lost in the confusion for Bravo, and Alpha's too detached from Bravo to recognize the significance of this. Moments later, I have to peel off to engage enemy vehicles moving towards the airfield, including two troop trucks. Bravo, FAC. Meanwhile, FAC is attempting to raise someone on the radio. Bravo multiple times, then Alpha. FAC's not able to see anything from their own position. Okay. Alpha, FAC. Alpha, FAC. It's about two minutes later when Alpha responds to FAC. Go for Alpha. Air's reporting contact uh, northwest of you. Can we get some clarification of markers down on that? The message is a little lost in translation. I'd noted the position as being to Alpha's immediate northwest, but after two minutes of trying to get someone to even respond, the message is watered down as simply northwest. Alpha doesn't see anything, but they'll try to get eyes on. Got no eyes on it at the moment. Uh, try to get eyes on it. Not realizing that the request is about the buildings immediately in front of Alpha, which they presumably would know about and know are occupied as they've been holding up their advance for some time now. Alpha, this is Bravo. Hold fire on that bunker, my guys are moving in now. Simultaneously, Bravo has finally become aware of the Line 2 threat, after their bunker assault team makes their realization, and both the bunker assault team and the base of fire team begin engaging it. This has been a long time coming. MG Bait, the two-story building to the uh, uh, southeast of that is loaded with motherfuckers on the second story. Bravo finally gets on the air with fact. Yeah, the fact is Bravo, sorry, I was in uh, communication hell there, what do you need? The message has now become distorted by the telephone game. Uh, Bravo Fact, do you have any information on the targets to your northwest? Fact asks Bravo if they have any information on targets to their northwest. Uh, wait one. Oxycube, you got anything to the northwest? The original message was about Alpha's immediate northwest, which translates to Bravo's southwest. Bravo looks to their northwest and doesn't see anything, but in doing so, believes that Fact is trying to clear the situation up regarding the B1 clear area, which is this compound. Confused by Fact's requests, Bravo lets him know that air is clear to attack the Bravo 1 clear marker to the northwest of Bravo. B1 clear marker has enemies just moved into it. Uh, all of our guys are outside of it. Tell air, tell Reaper he can hammer the shit out of that. Understood. To me, this is irrelevant for the moment, and I can hear that the situation is degrading over comms. So I try another We're tactic. Clear on the B1 clear compound. There's no problems in there. Letting Fact know that there are enemy southeast of the Alpha Objective 1 marker all over the airfield. There are a lot of enemy uh, southeast of the Alpha Objective 1 all over that airfield. I don't know why they're not calling for help or doing something about it. Yeah, copy. Getting information from the point team. Fact relays that it's difficult to get things done over the radio at this point due to the confusion. Then I can sympathize. At 550, Bravo has fully identified the Line 2 area as a threat and is communicating with Alpha to clear it, Alpha citing back. that they're in a crossfire because of the current. Alpha. This is roughly 10 Air minutes after Line 2 first began here, firing in the Bravo. Alpha has now advanced up to the Line 2 buildings, and as they work into this two-story building, the bunkers on the other side of the runway begin heavily engaging them. Bravo is taking heavy fire from bunkers 4 and 5, as well as Bunker 12 shooting at the Bravo 1 team that has cleared and occupied Bunker 13. At this point, I decide it's time to start engaging anything outside of bunkers that I can clearly identify as hostile. I can't shoot near Alpha, but there are enemies moving around outside of the bunkers near Bravo, so that's what I go for. Moments later, the Bravo squad leader is killed. Bravo itself has been whittled down to two people, the squad medic and one survivor of the Bunker 13 assault. Platoon Alpha Headquarters is trying to raise Alpha or Bravo to no avail. This is as good a time as any, so I peel off. The GAU-19 just isn't cutting it. As I fly off, I let the fact know my intent. I'm off station for miniguns. Yeah, when I come back, I'll be shooting at everything I think is enemy, so we'll see how that goes. It doesn't matter, though. Alpha and Bravo are gone. The few survivors, along with platoon headquarters, escape to the coast and fall back. It'll take a second platoon's arrival to finally clear the airfield fully. So why did this go so poorly? It comes down to a number of different elements combining. Communication, assumption, and coordination being the primary areas of failure. 
Alpha ran into stiffer resistance than expected, but this wasn't communicated up very well. Because of this, Bravo assumed that no news was good news and continued to push out past the support of Alpha. Now, the coordination that should have existed here with elements moving sequentially instead of simultaneously was assumed instead of deliberately communicated and coordinated. This assumption led to target fixation. Bravo identified Bunker 13 as key terrain, and the troops of Bravo tended to look towards that and not scan a flank that they assumed was being held by Alpha. When looking at the Line 2 area, Bravo assumed that the buildings marked on the map where Alpha was located were the same ones they could see at Line 2. But in fact, Alpha was held at Line 1, 50 meters southwest, and Line 2 was still strongly held by the enemy and masked from Alpha's fires. Particularly the upper floors of the two-story building on the Bravo-facing side, as well as bunkers 4 and 5. This fundamental misunderstanding was the crux of everything. The situation from my perspective didn't make sense. Looking at it from this reconstructed perspective, it still doesn't make sense. However, if you simply alter it to be the situation as Bravo assumed it to be, like this, suddenly it all becomes clear. Bravo legitimately thought that Alpha occupied Line 2 and was providing overwatch for their assault on Bunker 13. This basic assumption about where Alpha was caused a cascading failure effect. When Alpha called for Cass, Bravo, thinking that Alpha was at Line 2 already, when they were actually still back here, assumed that the bunker they were fixated on, Bunker 13, was the target for the call. But it wasn't. The bunker complex of 3, 2, and 1 was. Because of this, Bravo continued to dismiss fire coming from Line 2 as being friendly shots passing safely above or to the side. When struck by rounds, they thought they were ricochets. When asked for BDA, Alpha was unable to respond due to intense fighting and casualties. But instead of reflecting on this, Bravo answered fact to state that the strikes had good effect on target and that the target bunker was now empty. Bravo planned to make the push on Bunker 13, believing that their left flank was secured by Alpha and a supporting position for their assault. Air was trying to relay that Alpha and Bravo had a significant enemy force still between them. Alpha was in intermittent comms and heavily messed up. When Bravo 1 pushed to Bunker 13, they took fire from the Line 2 positions, including the now unmasked Bunkers 4 and 5. This is what caused Bravo to finally identify Line 2 as enemy occupied, but by then it was too late. Alpha was nearly wiped out, and Bravo was now taking fire from a massive arc. So what could have prevented this? Quite a few things, we'll cover the main ones here. First, of course, is communication. Alpha should have been talking more readily about their situation and their difficulties, and letting Bravo know that they weren't progressing as planned. Likewise, Bravo should have clarified instead of assuming things were rolling along. When it became clear that the airfield was heavily occupied, Bravo's task to establish a blocking position should have been modified to one of supporting Alpha through the airfield clearance. Two squads working together with a well-communicated limit of advance combined with proactive usage of close air support could have drastically reduced the difficulty of reaching and clearing the Line 2 positions. Individual members of Bravo were in positions to challenge the assumptions made as to where Alpha was and where fire was coming from, but for whatever reason this didn't happen. A higher level of situational awareness, particularly to the left flank, would have helped to identify the enemy fire that was directed at the squad from the Line 2 positions. Particularly when you have rounds impacting on terrain that couldn't be struck from anywhere but the southwest, that's a good cue that something's amiss. The forward air controller should have been inserted with the first wave, even if it meant leaving a member of Alpha or Bravo behind temporarily at base. The FAC was never able to get eyes onto the objectives due to initially co-locating with a heavily engaged Alpha, which negated the benefit of the role. But it's possible that arriving at the scene earlier would have allowed for key calls to be made early in engagement before Alpha was attreated and potentially shifted the course of the battle. Conveying information accurately was another factor. In a role like FAC, it's very important to be able to accurately relay key information without changing the meaning of it. In this case, a call for something being immediately northwest of Alpha ended up becoming just northwest, and then later, northwest of Bravo, drastically changing the meaning in the process. This happened with other elements as well. Alternatively, the FAC could have been positioned as a co-pilot of the AH-6, where the powerful sensor and aerial perspective could have significantly influenced the situation. The lack of a co-pilot degraded the AH-6's observation capabilities, making it unsafe to attack the Line 2 positions due to the proximity of Alpha and inability to differentiate between friend and foe. 
Utilization of casts as suppression and softening up of bunkers and buildings could have been used to help Alpha break the deadlock they found themselves in early on at Line 1, as well as help assist Bravo's assaults. Ultimately, the situation that developed here is a good example of trust but verify. Trust that your supporting squad will get the job done, but verify it before you put your own troops into potential danger. Assumptions can be very dangerous. When taken to an extreme like this, they can result in the annihilation of an entire assault force, as we saw here. I hope you enjoyed this look at a rather interesting situation that happened for us. This is Dyslexi. Until next time, take care. And remember that hindsight is always 2020.